Well, it's wonderful to see this place full and particularly on such a cold day. How many of you, you lost some power? I don't mean like physically, I mean, you know, like you're, how many, anybody without heat and you came anyway? Yeah, God bless you. You're a soldier, man, courageous. <laughs> yeah. Truth be told, most of us are sissies. We don't know what to do when the power goes out. It's like, oh, you know, I can't go outside. I'm in that category, by the way, <laughs> particularly with air conditioning, lack of air conditioning. You know, I look at a crowd like this and um, I have to acknowledge it's thrilling wish that it were like this every Sunday. Uh, we're seeing movement in that direction. But when I look at a crowd like this, I have a lot of things go through my head. And one of the things is, is that um, it would be fascinating to be able to hear our stories, uh, you know, our collective stories, you know, where we came from, what we've experienced, what molded us, what shaped us, what's still shaping us, making us who we are. And we'd hear all kinds of different things. We're, we're very different in lots of ways, let's be realistic. But we're also very much alike in a lot of ways. Every single person in this room, every single person wants to be happy. And I'm going to add an er. Everybody in this room wants to be happy er. Everybody wants to be happy all the time, as happy as is possible. And we all know it could be a little bit better. If we were honest, we'd say, there's been seasons in my life, maybe I'm in one right now, where I wish it were a little bit better. We, we all desire to be acknowledged, to be valued, to be liked, to be wanted, to be included. We hate feeling rejected. We, we hate feeling disrespected. We, we hate being betrayed. We have a lot of commonalities. And, and yet as much as we desire good for ourselves and more good, more good than what we know is technically likely to occur, we ourselves have to acknowledge that, that there's been times where yeah, I've been hurt, I've been wounded, I've been wronged, but there's also been times when I was the one that did the wrong. I'm the one that did the hurting. I'm the one that did the wounding. Now, I, I try to push those out of my mind, and I'm sure you do too, but if we're gonna be raw and honest here tonight, if we're gonna allow, if we're gonna allow God to try to really take hold of our hearts and minds tonight, if we're gonna make this more than just a, an evening where we enjoy some spectacular music, and effects, <laughs> then we've got to open our hearts and open our minds. And so we're so much different and so much alike. Now here's what I believe with all my heart because I've experienced it ongoing for nearly 50 years now. Regardless of where we're at in life, the quality of our life can be extraordinarily different. It can be elevated. Even though circumstances are not likely going to change in this old world of ours, we can change, be changed inside in a way that regardless of how cold it is in that bad old world out there, it can stay warm and comfortable inside of here. And, and what if, what if that the difference in the quality of every human's life, the difference in a person's eternal destiny, let's, let's be realistic, we all long to live forever if we could live forever with vigor and in a place where everyone's loved and happy and safe and secure. We don't want to die. We don't want to go out of existence. We all long for eternal life. And where does that longing come from? So what if... What if the key to this elevated quality of life, and I mean no matter who you are, where you are, what you're experiencing, how dug in, rutted in you might be, what if the key to elevating the quality of your life and even taking it past this life, it's all about this event, this event, this, this child, this baby born in a feeding trough, a, a peasant Jewish baby, what if everything is contingent upon this birth? I mean, what if your life, my life, every life that's ever been lived is all going to be qualitatively good or lack thereof based on our relationship with this baby? But this baby that we all know grew up, we set our calendars by this. The Western world sets our calendars by this event. Something actually happened. It's historical. It's true. It's compelling with evidences. So the first question that it brings to our minds when we think about this is, who was it? Who was this baby? Who was this child? Who is it that came? And there's a portion of the word of God. We're going to let God speak directly and let him tell us directly from his own word who it was that came. 
In the Gospel of John, it says this, in the beginning was the Word. Notice that it's capitalized. It's talking about a name of a person. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word, what does it say? Was God. That's a head twister there. With God, what? but the Word was God. Through Him, meaning the Word, through Him all things were made, meaning that this Word is the creator of everything that there is. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. And then the Christmas event, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. The reason that this birth of this baby is so significant, the reason that the birth of this baby and the life of this man and the sacrificial death of this man and the resurrection of this man, the only man to ever be resurrected, is so significant personally to you and I is because the Scripture says something else. It says we were made by Christ And we were made for Christ in Colossians 1.16. And it says, and apart from him, our lives never kind of coalesce. They never come together. They never hit full stride. They're never in harmony. There's always something missing. We try persons, places, and things to fill the gap, but nothing quite fills the gap. It goes on to say this in the book of Colossians, the apostle Paul writing to followers of Christ living in a Greek city called Colossae. That's how we get these weird names, these Bible names. Colossians 2.9. It says, for in Christ lives all, A-L-L, the fullness of who? God, but in a human body. This event is so spectacular because the creator of the universe reduced himself to human form that he might come to us vulnerably, he might come to us tenderly, that he might make known finally the fullness of his character. I mean, an almighty being is kind of intimidating, but when an almighty being is reduced to a baby... Unless the diaper needs changing, they're not very intimidating. (laughs) So it was none other than the creator come in human form and he came with a goal, he came with a purpose. And so let's consider that. Why did he come? The scripture answers this as well. In Matthew chapter 121, when Mary is being given the name to name the child, it says, she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus Because he will save his people from their, what? Sins. Why did he come? Jesus, why did you come? Why did you take on the form of an infant? Why did you live a life of a normal man? Why did you sacrifice your life on the cross? Why did you rise from the grave? Because Jesus wants to save me from that which I'm ignorant about. The things that are, that are wrecking my life, the things that are continuously pulling me three steps back every time I get two steps forward, the things that are hurting me when I know it, when I don't know it, the things that are hurting others, the things that are filling our world with endless conflict. This thing called sin. Now, when God calls something sin, it's simply the creator saying, that's not the way you were designed to function. For example, we could take a simple illustration. Dishonesty, the creator says, that's sin. You were created, you were designed to be honest. And so he's simply telling us, this is the only way that life works. This is the way I created you. God created us in his own image. We are meant to live the way God himself lives. And that will cause us to feel the way that God feels and to think the way that he thinks and to love the way that he loves ultimately. So when he's calling something a sin, he's simply telling us this won't work. You may not feel it immediately, but sooner or later you'll find this is not gonna work. This is sand in the internal machinery, the sociological machinery. We could expand it on a global level. There's one more verse in the book of Acts that says this. This individual, he heard the apostle Paul and Silas talking about Christ. They were in prison, an earthquake comes, the jails all open, and this Roman guard comes out and says, men, what must I do to be saved? Remember, they will call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. To save us from our sins, he has to win our trust. He has to convince us that sin is uh, is bad for us, it's not good for us. There's a lot of mental processing. What must I do to be saved? They said, trust in the Lord Yeshua, that's just Jewish for Jesus, and you will be saved. Remember, saved from our sins. Listen, it doesn't matter how much God wants to give me an elevated quality of life. It doesn't matter how much God loves me. If I don't trust him, if I don't trust him sufficiently 
to do what he says to do and to stop doing what he says stop doing. If I don't trust him enough that I will follow him, he's smarter than me, he's more loving than me, I'm finite, I'm imperfect, I can be selfish, he's not, and he simply says, I want to take you into life the way it was designed to be experienced, and I wanna take you into eternity, but I can't do anything, my hands are tied, my hands are nailed to a cross until you trust me. If you trust me, I can put you on a path that will lead you to life. And some of you are maybe thinking, but I've been on the path and I'm on for too long. I, I'm, I'm, it's too far gone for me to change. And yes, I'm talking about change. And yes, Jesus came to change me. And he came to change every single one of us because we all have sin in our life. And don't think of sin like I'm trying to pour a bunch of guilt on you. I'm saying sin is that I do stupid stuff. I don't know what I don't know. And so do you. And so he came to save us, but he can't, he can't save us unless we put our trust in him. And to win our trust, he came vulnerably. He came gently. He came as a baby. He lived as a man with gentleness and compassion and kindness. He did miracles that nobody else could do. He said things that nobody else could say. And then he deliberately allowed himself to be nailed to a cross, offering complete forgiveness to every human and laying there on the cross to let us know, this is how much I love you. I love you more than you can love yourself. I know what's best, I want what's best. I just need you to trust me. If you'll trust me and follow me, you'll know for yourself that I'm the only one that can give you the life you were meant to be given. So what, what does this change look like? I mean, in a realistic experiential sort of a way. In the New Testament book of Galatians, these are followers of Jesus living in the city of Galatia. Paul writes to them. He's talking about his own experience. I've had this experience too for nearly 50 years now. He said, my old self, the person I was before I trusted in Christ and was his follower, I was following Randy. I was doing my thing, my way, when I wanted, how I wanted, and so forth. My old self has been crucified with Christ that's hard language to take in it is no longer I who live but Christ lives in me we just heard the song where Mary is singing you know be born in me the apostle Paul is saying there was a time when as it were Christ was born in him came into him took possession of his mind and his heart his trust in such a way that it forever changed the trajectory of his life and he goes on to explain how this works so what does it mean for Christ to live in me and my old self to be crucified with him? So I live in this earthly body, how? Trusting, what does it say? Trusting in the Son of God who loved me, proven by his sacrificial death on the cross and his offer of complete forgiveness and acceptance, and he gave himself for me. So the way that Christ now can be born in us tonight, that his his presence can be a permanent influencer in our life is that when we put our trust in him and when we put our trust in him, the evidence will be is that we will start to learn his will, his word. We'll start to sit at his feet. We'll start to learn the way that God designed us to live, the laws of our being that we don't know. And so this trust starts to change the way we live every day of our life. It's a dynamic trust. Instead of doing my will, I want to do his will because when I see Christ, I see a superior life. I see somebody so much more beautiful than the person that I am apart from him. And so he wins our trust. Now, having said all of that, what, what jams this up? What, what, what hinders this from happening? Because the truth be told, you know, in an audience this size, I'm not trying to be insulting, but the truth be told, in an audience this size, some of us here have actually made the decision at some point to put our trust in Christ and become his follower. Everybody's following somebody. We're either following ourselves, our own ways, our own will, our own designs, desires and ideas, or we're following some other philosopher maybe, or we're following the creator, Christ. Now as we sit here, some of us have put our trust in Christ and we are Christians. As it were, Christ has been born in us and we are following him. And man, we're following him fully. He says, do it, we do it. He says, learn it, we learn it. He says, stop it, we stop it. Why? Because we trust him. We're, we're what the scripture calls Christians, Christ ones. And then some of us are not, and that's okay because there's a time in everybody's life and we're not until age 23. I was not. But for nearly 50 years now, I have been. Every regret that I have in my life has been a time in my life when I either unknowingly or knowingly 
neglected the will of God as it's revealed in the word of God. But every time I've been obedient to Christ, I find, wow, that's, that's a whole different quality of life. I didn't know it was possible to feel that way, think that way, become that way. So what can ruin this process? And maybe for you, you're wondering, you're sitting here maybe wondering, well, you know, man, this, this is just, it's cool. I just came out tonight for, you know, a good show and some music. And, and this is more than I was wanting, Randy. Well, hang in there with me. Hang in there. What hinders this process? Galatians, the apostle Paul, once again, he says, my children, I'm again suffering in labor pains for you until Christ is what? formed in you and he gets formed in us when we put our trust in him and become his follower so what hinders us i want to share three things and then three more first of all some of us are so distracted we're just busy 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 and we just don't have time for god i don't want to be insulting but that's insanity that's irrationality the most important person in the universe, the person that makes you fully human and fully alive is Christ, your creator. To not have time for him is to so cheat yourself and miss the very purpose of your existence. But some of us are too distracted. And then to be truth, some of us, we're just disinterested. We, we just have other things we're interested in. We just kind of shrug our shoulders. Oh, you know, God, if you need God, that's cool for you, man. That's good. I'm, I'm happy for you, Randy, but... You know, I, I don't care about God. And I, I break for you because when you have no interest in your creator, let me tell you something, your soul is hanging by a thread. You are not fully human and fully alive. You say, who are you talking to, Randy? I got degrees. I got doctorates. I make $300,000 a year, you know, yada, yada, yada. So what? You can be fully, fully an empty souled human, a dead soul human, and not alive and have all those things. So some of us are just disinterested to our own loss and the loss of those around us because the better version of ourselves will never come until we unite with our creator Christ, trust in him so that his presence is dynamically changing us every day of our life, every season of our life. And then some of us that ultimately we just don't trust him. We just feel like, man, I kind of like the way I live. When I do things my way, uh, I know what at least to expect. It might not be perfect, but at least my hands are on the steering wheel and I don't want anybody else's on the steering wheel. And yet Christ's whole reason for coming as a baby, living as a man, doing the miracles that he did, sacrificially giving himself on the cross, rising from the gate, grave, the whole reason was to win your trust, to let you know that there's no one else that can give you the life that you want. You want this life deep in your core. You want a life where everybody's loved, everybody's healthy, everybody has what they want, everybody's a brother, everybody's a sister, nobody's disrespected, nobody's rejected, nobody's cheated, nobody's betrayed, nobody's um, assaulted, and, and I could go on and on. He is the only one that can bring that kind of life, but he wants to first bring his life into us to be carriers of that life. Now, there's three last things that keep us from letting Christ be formed in us. Here they are. Some of us are fear. We, we picture God in a way that is not accurate to his character. And with the fear comes a sense of guilt and some of us shame. Guilt is, I know I've done a lot of things wrong. Shame is, there's something sick in me. There's something wrong with me. I'm a reject, man. I'm, I'm just not fit and I know it. That's, that's three things that can keep us. We can feel like I've gone too far. There's something wrong with me. God would never be able to accept someone like me. And so these things keep us from just trusting Christ, just coming to him as we are. Now, some of us view God knowingly and unknowingly as this. We view God as a prosecutor in a court setting that he is looking for every single misdeed we've ever done. He is looking for every flaw in our character. He's, he's looking for every miscue we've ever made, and he's going to find ground to condemn us. That's how we knowingly or unknowingly vision, have a vision of God. Some of us, probably few, I wish there were more, view God as an ER physician. Now, the ER physician, like the prosecutor, is looking for everything that's wrong. The prosecutor's looking for everything that's wrong to condemn us. The ER physician is looking for everything that is wrong so that he can heal, he or she can heal us and help us. That's the vision of God. When you go to the ER, the ER is gonna to try to heal you, try to put you back on your feet, try to mend you, try to give you life, regardless of whether you're the cause 
of the damage that you've incurred that you're in there. They look at you with unconditional eyes, we could say, of love, though it may not be that kind. But God is like the ER physician. Yes, he is going to point out to me, he has been pointing out to me for nearly 50 years, every mistake, every miscue, every misunderstanding I have about life so that he can heal me and help me and change me to be the Christ-like version of myself that I was meant to be. Now, as I get ready to shut this down, we were looking for Christmas music some months back. And so I was, I was on YouTube, you know, and I'm looking at all these Christian, you know, music, uh, Christian, Christian Christmas music. And it's really hard to find good new Christian music for Christmas, I can just tell you that. So I'm looking, you know, and you know how in the column there'll be all these songs listed, and most of them were just typical Christmas songs. And then all of a sudden I saw this one song and the song title didn't fit Christmas at all. And I thought, you know, I'm just going to hit that thing. I want, I want to know what that song is. And some of you didn't know me. No, this is not that unusual. But man, I sat there in my office, tears pouring down my face. And I knew that I knew that I knew we got to do that song somehow. I shared it with Pastor Pete. He resonated with it. And then I had my affirmation that I was looking for. So. I want you to listen carefully what I'm about to say. I've walked with God for a lot of years now, and the best that I can humanly tell, God is making a great effort to speak to someone or some someones very personally here tonight. You can change your life starting tonight. You can get on a pathway tonight that you will be and the quality of your life will be forever different. God is, God is reaching out and you're gonna know who you are when you hear the words to this song. Because some of you, it's your fear, it's your shame, it's your guilt, it's, it's the feeling that you've gone too far, you can't change, it could be a whole mass of things. But I want you to, as you hear this song, and it's a wonderful song, and Pastor Pete does an amazing job on it. But listen to the words because it's in those words you're gonna know if this song is sent to you from the very heart of God for such a time as this. And if you know it's sent to you, because even we that are, that are followers of Christ, sometimes we're still unnecessarily struggle, struggling with feelings of shame and guilt that we haven't fully allowed the love and the forgiveness of God to cleanse us of. And maybe for you, this is, this is the song that God's sending to you. But I'm telling you, somebody in here, if your heart is open, you're gonna have your life changed. You mark it down from this night on. You will know that you know that you know that God brought you here for such a moment as this. Be courageous. If you hear the Spirit of God stirring your heart, be courageous. Put your trust in Christ tonight become his follower. I promise you, hold me to it. You will regret a lot of things in life. You will never regret this decision. Listen to the words and listen to the Spirit of God trying to speak very personally to someone or some someones in this room.
Writing you off, leaving you lost He's not sitting there shaking his head Wishing he'd never went to that cross He's not sitting there shaking his head Writing you off, leaving you lost He's not sitting there shaking his head He went to that cross, he went to that cross He's not sitting there shaking his head going to do something that I don't usually do but I feel so strongly about this moment and about this song and about God's intention to capture the trust of somebody in this room I'm going to make a plea with you you know who you are if the Spirit of God has affirmed this make your decision put your trust in Christ come as you are don't let your guilt your shame your feelings that you're too far gone none of that because it's not true it's just not true so I'm going to make a plea with you. Be reckless and put your trust in Christ. Make your decision tonight to become his follower. For you that are already a follower of Christ, but you have been endlessly feeling shameful and guilty and, and tormented by things from the past, allow the Spirit of God to affirm to you that God will remember your sins no more. It says in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, it says that I will remember their sins no more. No room for shame, no room for guilt. God wants us to feel comfortable, safe in His presence. May this be the night that forevermore you'll say, I will trust in God's complete forgiveness and I will no longer, I will no longer hold on to shame. Can I pray with you? Father, I know you're at work. I know you're seeking so much to get into the lives and into the hearts of some people, people that are unnecessarily uh, hurting and people that are such in need of you. May your spirit affirm that your arms are open wide. There's no barrier. They're welcome. And you're bidding them home. I ask this in Christ's name. Amen.